Welcome to Discovering Hair, the podcast that delves deep into the world of hair covering in the Orthodox Jewish community and beyond. I'm your host, Amalia, and today I want to discuss an experience shared by so many women in Israel today. Covering hair while one's husband is away in the army for potentially lengthy periods of time. Since the war began in Israel on October 7th, almost every person has likely ha- had a close family member or friend serving in the IDF. As a young Ola myself, I personally have many friends, as well as more prominently for me, spouses of close friends serving in the war in Gaza and in the north. Because of my interest in topics related to hair covering, a frequent concept I've discussed with friends is what their experiences are in covering hair while potentially not seeing their spouse for months at a time. I was curious how not actively living with their spouses might have shifted their relationship and perspectives to hair covering. As I look to come back to podcasting and discussing hair covering at large, despite the war unfortunately continuing with no clear end in sight, I want to first put a spotlight onto army wives and their hair covering experiences, and as Pesach with with all its simcha approaches, to not lose sight of the sacrifice so many people are still making every single day. Today, I will be speaking with my dear friend Dina to discuss her experience covering her hair while her husband has been on reserve duty since the beginning of the war. Each individual's experience will obviously be different, but I believe what Dina has to say will resonate with many women whose spouses are serving and also provide insight to those of us who are not experiencing this challenge about what such women experience and how we might be able to help. Hi, Dina. Hi, how's it going? (laughs) I'm really excited to sit uh, with you today and discuss this topic. It's been something that's um, been on my mind for a very long time since the war started. Uh, how many how many months ago is that now? Like four, I think. Wow. Okay. So it's been on my mind for four months. I haven't been experiencing my husband being in reserves or being away from home during the during the war, thankfully. But it's something I've seen a lot of friends have surrounding me. And so it's something that I just really want to hear about that experience. Before we jump into the initial topic, if you could tell me a little bit about yourself, start with just a little bit of background to you, who you are. <laughs> I'm originally from Boston. I'm Aelia about three years ago. And I spent two years there near Migdolos, went to Barilan, and now I'm learning in the Tagel, like women's learning program. When did you get married? We got married at the end of this past May, so about Mm -hmm. eight months ago. And your husband's currently in reserves? Yeah. Uh, Can you say where he's based? So he's been based up north. He was moving around a bunch. And, like, mostly there was some parts of it were him, like, guarding communities. Some parts were him guarding the border. So there were different stages I guess some more dangerous some less dangerous but he didn't tell me until after he left the dangerous places where he was always a Um, good call (laughs) yes (laughs) definitely yeah Uh, but he he was drafted I think three weeks into the war so the first three weeks for me were like oh wow thank god he's home because all my friends whose husbands were in it was very very nerve-wracking but for him, it was really hard because he just wanted to be doing his part. But it's also crazy for us that we've been married for eight months and four of those months he's been in the army. So, wow. I think it's it's crazy to hear it when you say it. And like, sadly, it's so not an experience that's just unique to you because thinking about that, I can think of like five other people I know who are in a similar situation. Unique experience that people have especially being so newly married. I think it's really worth exploring those emotions because I think it's something that can really resonate with a lot of people and also that a lot of people are going through. Let's talk about focusing in on the hair covering part of your experience for your husband going into Miwim or into reserves. So did you start covering your hair immediately when you got married? What were your expectations before you got married about hair covering? If you could break that. I did start right away. I remember getting to the hotel after the wedding and being like, oh, wow, this is the last time the world is going to see my hair. It's also kind of crazy. I have curly hair. And for the first few months, a lot of people would say, oh, my God, I didn't recognize you. And it was because everyone recognized me by my curly hair. And now it's not there. So I kind of felt a little bit like I had lost a part of my identity. 
that part doesn't bother me as much now. I'm more just like, oh, people who meet me now have no idea that I have curly hair, which is also a crazy thing. But yeah, I don't, I don't mind it so much. I think there are some people who are really like, oh my God, I hate this. This is the worst part of being married. And they were dreading it beforehand. Another part about having curly hair is that it's hard to keep it looking neat. So now I'm like, oh, great. I don't have to worry about smushing it when I go to sleep or making sure it doesn't look frizzy in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind it so much. I think the, the one thing that's been a little bit annoying is that now I definitely think twice before I leave the house because there's one other thing to put on before I leave. So. I beyond relate to that. I feel like I became a hermit after getting married and not necessarily yeah. <laughs> like because, oh, so nice. I'm with my husband all the time and I'm a hermit. No, it's because it's the extra step of needing to leave the house with something on your head. What ways do you typically cover your hair right now? For anyone watching like the video of this, so you're wearing a scarf in a more Israeli-like style, uh, as I am as well. Is that always the way you cover your hair? What other methods do you use? So I mostly do this during the week, I guess. Sometimes I'll wear like a pre-tied tichel or a not pre-tied tichel. I honestly find that this just stays on my head better. <laughs> but on Shabbos, I sometimes, depending on how hot it is, like to wear a fall. I also have a lace top, but I think the fall looks more like me than the lace top does. So I mostly wear that when I'm in America or around my American in-laws or things like that. I, I think a lot <laughs> of women living in Israel have a little bit of a similar experience regarding, you know, the going back to America, that's your week to get the wear out of that very expensive piece of hair that you put on your head that very rarely goes on my head for like a long period of time or consistently. <laughs> yeah, I also remember you telling me right after you got married that a lot of people in Israel, if you're wearing a wig, think that you're Haredi. <laughs> so it's very interesting. But I guess it also depends what community you're in. Like if I go to visit like my husband's Anne and Ramapi Chemesh, then there are far more people wearing wigs, even though they're not Haredi. I also still remember a couple months before I got married, I went back to America to visit like my home community or whatever. And one of our family friends walked up to me in Shul and was like, so have you figured out how you're going to cover your hair yet? Because, you know, in Israel, it really defines what group of people you identify with. And I was just like, oh my God, why are you putting all this pressure on oh me? Gosh. Like, that's so stressful. So, but I think, I think it really does hold true that in a lot of ways, people in Israel judge you. Yeah. and your religious observance based on how you cover your hair. I will say, maybe I'll do a separate episode on it. Personally, what I've been seeing a lot more of, a lot of Israeli women starting to wear wigs outside of the Haredi space. That's just an interesting cultural shift that I think is maybe starting to happen. And I would definitely maybe explore that at a different time. So you said that for you, it, it definitely changed a little bit of your, your relationship to hair covering was never one of like, major strife like it definitely has its annoyances how I guess did you view hair covering on an emotional level when you think about the mitzvah of, uh, of kisoy rosh or hair covering like what was that feeling for you initially when I got married it was kind of this not in a aside from the religious aspects it was kind of like oh this is a new thing that I get to you know go through some process and practice and get better at it get faster at it and also like if you have boring outfits then it can really like spice it up you know you used to wear a black dress and be like wow I think I look like I'm going to a funeral but now you can wear some really colorful mipaka or scarf or whatever and it's another dynamic I think I I honestly just didn't think about it too much I think there are a lot of people who have very strong feelings about it and get very upset about it. I guess maybe I was nervous that if I started to think about it too much that it would start to upset me a little bit. But I also, I don't really feel upset by it. Like, I'm not like, oh my God, this is the worst mitzvah ever. And how could we be asked to do this? And I'm just like, okay, like it's, it's part of being married. And sometimes it also is nice to have that identification or kind of that reminder 
of my husband on a daily basis as I'm like walking around. I'm like, oh yeah, it's not just, you know, the little ring on my finger that someone may or may not notice, but it does identify me more with being married and it's it's nice to have that. So that's something I was going to really shift into as we talk about your experience when your husband was then called into the army. How do you feel that your relationship to hair covering has shifted in that time? Meaning the aspect you're speaking of, of that symbolic reminder, whether to you or to other people, have you appreciated it more? Or has it bothered you more? Where are you kind of in that? So I think in some ways it was nice that even if my husband was away for a long stretch of time, that I could kind of walk around in the world and not just forget that, oh, I'm not a single person and there is someone out there who is a big part of my life. And I think in some ways it frustrated me a little bit sometimes where I would get on the bus and be alone and everyone sees that I'm wearing mipaha and maybe they assume my husband's at home and maybe they assume he's at work or whatever it is and that's why he's not with me. But it was just a little bit sad. And also Friday afternoon, I think, Maybe this was a better aspect of it. If I'd be waiting at the bus stop by myself with a suitcase, then, you know, the fact that I'm wearing Mipaha, everyone knows, oh, that's probably an army wife who's standing there by herself because her husband isn't home. So that was both good and bad. I think something a little bit annoying was since my husband wasn't home, there'd be times where a repairman would come and I'm the only one home. So then I would have to put something on my head instead of just putting on a skirt. Um, or if I was staying by a different family, I stayed by my husband's aunt's family for a little while and, um, they were really nice and welcoming and took me in, but I couldn't just hang around in my pajamas or whatever. I would have to wear a skirt anyway, but I couldn't fully be comfortable. And I always had to be covering my hair all the time, even though I was living there. So that was also a little bit annoying, I guess, but. Okay. Other than that, not not so much. Do you feel once you got married, did you feel a shift in how people kind of saw me? Like, oh, this is a married woman. And I guess, you know, you touched on this a little bit, but how does that perception make you feel now when you're a married woman, but not living a, I guess, traditional married lifestyle because you're not living with your husband on a daily basis? I definitely did feel a bit of a shift. I guess I look a little bit younger than I am. And so I would go to the grocery store before I got married and I would always get carded. And then ever since I got married, that never happens to me anymore, which is so nice. And also like, I think sometimes people used to call me like famuda or like cutie, whatever that goes with more of being younger and now people call me like Gvered instead which is a little bit funny to me but I guess it's nice to not feel like a child when I'm out in public I think other than that like it it hasn't changed so much since my husband has been away I know I have friends who have said being an army wife is the worst of both worlds it's all of the annoying things of being married without the positives because you still have to cover your hair but you don't get to live with your husband so yeah, I guess I didn't feel that so much. I felt it a little bit, but do you yeah. feel it on a broader sense when it when it doesn't come to covering your hair? Especially you were married for a very short time before your husband then went into like living a single life, but it's also a married life. I'm curious whether that experience resonates more or less or, you know, if it's an equivalent experience for someone who's been married for a shorter period before immediately jumping into that. I guess we were married for long enough that I got a little bit used to the married life. Honestly, for the most part, I tried to avoid like staying with single friends and in roommate apartments because it it just felt not too weird, but like it just felt hard. I'm not single anymore. And my husband is somewhere. Not that singles being a bad thing or anything like that, but kind of just the struggle of missing my husband felt harder if I were to go back and stay in a roommate's apartment and feel like I was single again. I definitely did hang out with friends more. And honestly, I think that was good. And it was fun. And there were things I was able to do that I couldn't do otherwise, like have a sleepover 
for Shabbos with a friend or like stay out late and not have to worry that like, oh, my husband's waiting for me. But I think part of me just wanted to remind myself that I was still married. And even if he wasn't here, that like he he is somewhere. I, I think that's very powerful. And that's a positive spin on, you know, you were saying you have friends who are very frustrated, like, oh, you get all the bad parts of being married. And there's something very powerful to looking at it as a signifier of marriage. I don't think that works for everyone. As you clearly said, like there are people who are just very frustrated by hair covering and the other aspects that you still have to deal with of being married that aren't, I guess, the fun stuff. It never resonated with me so much like, oh, this is a signifier of my married identity because I felt, okay, there's another signifier that I'm married. I'm wearing a wedding ring or whatever, but it certainly is a much You know, I feel this on my head a lot more than I feel my ring. And as you're speaking, I definitely am thinking about a lot more like the power of flipping to that perspective, especially when you're when your spouse is not readily available to you at all times. I'm curious to hear your experience beyond hair covering. You know, what have I, I, I think there's a lot of women who are in a similar situation to you. And also there's plenty of women who thankfully are not in your situation, but are really, I think, curious to understand the experience more and understand what they can do better for other people and friends around them. What have you found specifically to help you cope during this time? What have been kind of the best times for you and best situations and experiences? I think, honestly, friends who've reached out and invited me for dinners whenever I'm home by myself or like ask me to make sure I have Shabbos plans or things like that but just like having friends out there who will check in and kind of make me feel like people haven't forgotten and especially you know the past few weeks where all of my friends husbands have come home and mine is still out there that it started to feel a little bit like everyone's going back to normal life and no one remembers that I'm still dealing with this. So friends who've reached out and keep checking in and just make sure that I feel seen and heard, which is really nice. I'm sure that like many listeners in America, like want to know what they could do for million wives or just, you know, wives with husbands in the army right now. Is there anything concrete you could point to that would be helpful to you or to you know, you think like either on a broad scale or on a small scale. I think even if you're in America and you have a friend whose husband is in the army, just checking in and not necessarily expecting that they'll answer because sometimes, you know, you're just having a bad day and you don't want to talk to anyone. But like just knowing that there are people out there who care about you is really nice. Also, I feel bad asking people for this, not I would feel bad asking for this in general, but also as someone who doesn't have kids yet, asking for like, not asking, but you know, just if people would send, I don't know, gift cards or like send your friend a little bit of money to do something nice for themselves or to get takeout or something like that. I think that was happening a lot at the beginning of the war and it kind of petered off as things do but just like you know in a time that isn't so fun sometimes it's nice to be like oh yeah one of my friends just sponsored dinner for me and it was so nice and I also just ordered something really fun and yummy and I didn't have to make dinner for myself so just that pinook or you know a nice thing that makes you feel special and brightens your day a little bit yeah I want to say because I'm not a an army wife I, you know, I, I can more concretely tell people that's definitely something you should be doing for these women if yeah. you when if you can and you have the means like it's I think it really, you know, I, I, I feel like it depends who I who I'm speaking to, like some of, you know, some of my friends whose husbands are in the army, I think, understand how pivotal their role is. And I think others, you know, play it down a lot more. But the role of like the home front and keeping morale up and like soldiers knowing that their wives are happy and that's so important and then uh, like for the country at large and then of course you know on an individual human level and on an amisara level like 
to know that there are women struggling or just having a really rough time and going through something difficult and they're sacrificing quite a lot for the country, you know, to keep those people in mind. And especially, I think, you know, it, it, you're, you make a really good point that as the war has gone on, just so many of the small efforts, both, both things we've been doing for soldiers and for like army wives as well, have really slowed. And, you know, that's to be expected, unfortunately. But, you know, I, I hope that anyone who listens to this and we're at this point in the war takes this as another opportunity to maybe think about those people again and think about what what can be done for their friends, both on a like financial level and on a and on a personal like level. Yeah, I, um, I went to a couple of weeks ago and my husband happened to be home at the time. So we went together and we were talking to someone and he said, you know, to my husband, thank you so much for everything you've been doing. And then he turned to me and he said, thank you also. Like you're, you're really like contributing a lot and sacrificing a lot. And it just felt really nice to be recognized. Like I'm not out there, you know, staying up till all hours in the freezing cold and rain. And I'm not doing anything scary, putting myself at risk, but you know, there, there definitely is something to be said for all the wives who are staying home by themselves or taking care of their kids by themselves. And it definitely felt nice to be recognized. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. I feel like sometimes people like I've heard people say it and, you know, kind of say it, but like half, like if you're talking to both spouses, then, Oh, well, thank you so much for everything you've been doing. And like, Oh, and of oh, course, and you thank too. you to you too. Yeah. <laughs> like, but it's a, yeah. you know, to hear it in a very genuine and real way, I think is really important and helpful. I, I would. Yeah, imagine. I think I think a lot of people just don't even really think about it because everyone thinks about the people who are doing all of the hard things practically, and it just comes to mind a lot easier to think about oh the Chayalim who are doing things, but don't forget there are other people out there who are going through hard stuff because of that. So I have one more question on the on the hair covering front, I just wasn't, I, I, it just came to my mind now. Have you found yourself, you know, you, we, we've been talking about hair covering as a sense of like identity to being married. Have you found yourself leaning more towards wearing scarves than you otherwise would because of that or not really? I'm just curious. In what, in what Meaning way? in the sense that it's a signifier to other people of your married identity. Like obviously like, and oh, like as opposed to yeah. uh, like, a shaito that isn't so noticeable yeah that's less noticeable I guess although plenty of shaitos are noticeable to the people around you and they certainly are very right. noticeable to yourself so right I mean I can say about like a lace top for instance that's less noticeable I just don't really wear it enough in settings where I wouldn't necessarily want to be identified that way and I think usually when I'm wearing it everyone knows that yeah. it's a wig but I definitely, I have toyed with the idea of wearing a fall with Katsumi Paha, like just kind of a scarf as a headband, which is definitely a style in Israel. And I did it for the first time last week. Hey, she looked very um, cute, I have to say. <laughs> was at my house. Thank you. But I kind of thought about it for a long time, mostly because, you know, if you weren't looking too closely, you might think that it was my actual hair. And that would be identifying myself with a very, not very different, but just different sort of community than I might normally identify myself with. So it was, it was definitely a thought. I think for, for anyone who cares enough, it's, you, you definitely can tell that it's not my hair, but definitely, you know, there's also the like hushkafic point of, oh, do I want to kind of make myself look like I am part of that culture, even though I'm still covering the same amount of hair. Like, you know, there's the people who wear the spaghetti strap dresses with a shell underneath and like, you know, they want to wear a spaghetti strap dress. So they're wearing it in a way that's sneeze. But like, obviously, there's nothing wrong with it. But you know, it's it's just a kind of hush preference, preference yeah. I guess. Yeah, I think about those things a lot, too. It's definitely like, I, these are all topics that I want to get to in episodes because, you know, even wearing like a chatsimipaha, like a half, a half scarf with my fall is something like, I also am always like, 
debating whether I do, don't do like, and those issues definitely come up for myself as well. And I want to kind of devote some real time to it. So I think we're pretty much done. And I have a few like fun and, and questions to end off with. So what is your favorite children's book? This is maybe a less well-known one. It's called Tacky the Penguin. Um, definitely, <laughs> definitely one of my favorite books growing up. And even now it came up recently with my husband and I was like, I can't believe that I've never told you about this before. It's, it's about, it's a very, very funny book. You can find it on YouTube in a read aloud. It's about a penguin who is different from all of his friends and just much quirkier and funnier. His friends are all very like type A and very neat and prim and in the box. And he's very like out of the box and all over the place. And he kind of just adds color to their life. And they always think he's the odd one out and he's messing everything up and they're marching perfectly and he's not. But then at the end, he ends up saving the day. So wow. they learn from him. Yeah. I got I got to check out this book. I love that you know that it's on YouTube and read aloud form, which is clearly not, <laughs> I assume, how you listen to it when you were actually a child. No. I found it when I had to show it to my husband. So I literally, I, I'm, I'm going to check it out because I, I sometimes fall asleep to children's books when like my mind's like very like uh, all over the place and I need like need That's to like calm idea. down. It's so, it's so much better than white noise. Like it just makes you feel good to like hear like, if you give a mouse a cookie, like. <laughs> wow, I love that. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Highly recommend. Okay, so I'm always fascinated by consumer culture and the attachments we make with the things we own. What is one item in your house that you would like to get rid of but haven't? I'll be impressed if you mm. don't have one in your house. <laughs> this question I forgot to think about. I think probably there's just clothes that I haven't worn in a while and I somehow just decide that I still need it for some reason definitely yeah the full like storage under our bed is like bags and bags of like winter clothes and we live in a very hot climate and I've convinced myself like I can't get rid of these like what I don't like I don't know next time you know I'll want to wear that like like it like that giant sweater and all of these items. And that's only the winter stuff. I'm being kind to myself yeah. <laughs> about all the summer clothes I don't wear even now. Yeah. I think when you move around a lot and you're, you don't have parents and like a base house that you could just keep all your, your stuff extra at. stuff at in this country that you tend to kind of have less stuff and keep less stuff that you don't need. Yeah. I mean, that's great for you. I feel like I've slowly accrued quite a lot <laughs> that I still don't feel I need but yeah. perhaps less than le less than I used to if you were given a million dollars to start your own cassette project what would you do with it hmm, I forgot to think about this one also it's better <laughs> we get it like an in the moment response <laughs> yeah you could cut out all of my thinking time I've definitely thought of things like relatively recently but I just can't think of it doesn't necessarily need to be like a specific idea. It can also be a specific like group you'd want to target or, you know, even even if you feel like there's a specific charity you want to highlight that does exist, that like, we can also talk about that. I guess probably some organization for Olim. I think there are a number, but none of them really run very well or have enough funds or things like that and I think there are always Olim who need help with scores of different things whether it's bureaucracy or free stuff because you know making Aliyah hard or um, I would like a free stuff organization yeah <laughs> <laughs> or you know I think I think a lot of it is like figuring out how adult stuff in this country works I think Maybe if there was an organization like that, that kind of explained everything that you would ask your parents if you still lived in America, but you don't really have anyone to ask now, like, it would be so great if there was something like that. I sometimes think that I just want to be like, meaning I have Israeli friends who have Israeli parents I could ask things to, but like, sometimes it feels like too, like personal, like you know them or you don't want them to know, like, you know, something about your finances or something about like a specific aspect of your life. And I want like an anonymous like hotline of just like an Israeli mom, you know, like that's what, yeah, that, that's something. Or I even like. also like 
sometimes that would work. I think there are also things where you kind of need someone to explain, oh, this is the equivalent of the American blank. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely something as in a lot that definitely resonates with me as something I need more of and sounds like a very worthy cause. Okay, thank you so much for taking the time to do this with me. Like, I think it's really important, you know, to me to start this podcast up again. This has been a project that's been in my mind for about a year at this point, And I really wanted to get it started. And then with the war and everything, it just didn't feel right. And I want to start this podcast, you know, really putting the stories of women who are impacted by the war in some way on the forefront before we and hair covering in relation to that on the forefront before I continue on to, you know, some of the still serious and important topics, but, you know, that are less related to this very clearly big issue that's go like that's going on with for the Jewish people for the foreseeable future at this point. Thank you very much. It really was helpful to sit down and talk to you about this. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. In this episode, I genuinely wanted to amplify the voices of army wives who are heroes really in their own right and dig into some challenges that these women might be experiencing. As I move forward with this podcast and allow myself to discuss topics unrelated to the war in Israel, I still find it crucial that the experiences pertaining to hair covering and the war be at the forefront of our discussions. Restarting the podcast with this interview, I believe will set us on the right track and with the right focus as we continue to discover hair. I have a few more episodes planned that pertain to the war that I hope to cover. For now, though, I hope you will join me as I shift back to discussions of scarves, purchasing wigs, migraines, etc. If this episode resonated with you, please share it with friends and family and subscribe to keep following the journey of discovering hair.